Okay, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to wherever you are in the world and you're joining us. Thank you very much for joining us on day three for our workshop on AI and HPC technology in semiconductor manufacturing presented by KLA in collaboration with IIT Madras Nodal Center for Training in AI and HPC under the National Supercomputing Mission. I'm Pradeep from KLA. I'm co-organizing co this workshop with Rupesh from IIT Madras. And it's a pleasure to welcome you on day three of this workshop. A brief look at the workshop agenda. Uh, the agenda is laid out as a path from the problem space as outlined by Chris on Monday. As outlined by Chris on Monday, and we go down the application space where Jacob spoke yesterday about challenges in adopting ML in manufacturing. Steve then uh, helps transition from the application space through the infrastructure. And then uh, Mark and I on tomorrow and day after will be talking a little bit more closer to metal about GPUs and CPUs. So we finished the first two sessions already. We had over 3000 live attendees on both days and over 5,000 playbacks on YouTube already. It's a tremendous response. Thank you all very much for recommending your friends and colleagues to see it. The slides are already available for both these sessions on the workshop website. And the recording is also available for YouTube or in YouTube for anyone to see. So in case you missed it or you're just very interested to see it again, please go ahead and use them. Today, we will be talking about building AI models in the fab. And we have with us Steve, who will be talking about this today. While we welcome everybody to see these talks, uh, we have actually prepared the talks with a certain audience in mind such that we could tailor the content. We assumed that the ideal audience for this would be somebody at a level of a senior, that's the fourth year in engineering college or first year masters in computer science, EE or in any sciences. If you are less experienced than that, we definitely recommend that you first get some, uh, some exposure to some of the background material, including machine learning algorithms, distributed computing, semiconductor device modeling, and GPU programming, and then come back and see these recorded videos. Of course, attend today, grasp as much as you can, get this background again in machine learning, distributed computing, manufacturing of semiconductors and modeling, and GPU programming, and come back and see these lectures for you to really become excited about this space. And we also realize that we use a lot of terminology that might not be immediately familiar to you. Since we dwell in this space, we tend to um, be a little strong on terminology. So we have tried to address it in both the second and today's talk where we have a glossary of terms that we will be talking about. If there still continues to be some confusion about what certain terms mean, please ask your questions in Q&A and we'll be happy to answer them. Before we go ahead with the talk, some basic workshop logistics that I want to go over. I'm glad to see again, we are closing, inching close to 2000 participants uh, in the webinar. So it's the same link to join the Zoom webinars. The YouTube live streams are per session. We sent all the links out on Tuesday morning, India time, Monday night, Pacific time. And that's why we did not send another email this morning. Just don't want to spam your inboxes. Preferably join over Zoom. Uh, for the full experience, because you can then be completely involved in Q&A and, &A and uh, you know, participate in that experience. Of course, use the YouTube as well, live for backup and for playback, YouTube is a tremendous resource. Each session follows a very similar pattern. First 10 minutes, we go through setup and some basic introductions. The next 40 minutes, we play back a pre-recorded talk. We did this recording such that, you know, given the scale of this workshop, we didn't want to run into connectivity issues. So we do the next 40 minutes of playback and we reserve at least 10 minutes for Q&A. In fact, yesterday we got close to 15 minutes of Q&A with some tremendous questions that were answered and we had very good engagement. So I'm glad to see that the Q&A sessions are you know, very informative and very engaging. Please use the Q&A window to post your questions at any time. Since the speakers and the panelists are available, some of your questions may get answered while the talk is being played back. A select few will be selected and answered by the speaker at the end in the Q&A section. We'll talk a little bit more about how to manage the Q&A windows a little bit. And finally, if you're interested in the certificate of participation, remember that the expectation is for you to attend at least 80% of all five talks. Attendance on Zoom is via the portal. 
And for YouTube, we need to fill out a Google form, which we will post as a pinned comment after the introduction is completed. Please make sure to use the same name and email to join uh, the webinar or to fill it out in the YouTube form. If it so turns out that your Zoom name does not match, please go ahead and just join the YouTube link and fill that form out. Remember, you only need to do one, you don't need to do both. So if in Zoom, you're matching with your registered email and name, you don't need to do the YouTube bit. We decided to provide some suggestions of housekeeping to enable the interactions in both Zoom and YouTube to be good based on experience for the first two days. Again, exercise your judgment when you ask Q&A in Zoom or post comment on YouTube to keep them relevant, right? Remember, we have, again, we crossed over 2,000 attendees today as well, and we are 3,000 over 3,000 the first two days. So those channels can get really flooded very fast. So please be attentive as to what you're asking them. So avoid greetings, right? I mean, it's wonderful to hear from all of you. We're very happy to engage with you, but imagine thousands of highs flying over these comments. It's very difficult to then see the relevant questions. And when you're posting questions, please form them in full sentences so we understand you know, what exactly you're trying to ask such that we can keep our answers very precise. To reiterate on attendance, because we get a lot of these questions, remember that workshop attendance is automated on Zoom and it's via Google form on YouTube. Don't post your email addresses in Q&A or comments. We don't do attendance that way. It's only through one of these two forms. If you're in Zoom, you don't need to do anything. You're automatically recorded. If you're interested in an opportunity with KLA, please reach out separately. There are several avenues right to me. You can look us up online and reach out to us. If you have any audio video issues, please check your volume or move between Zoom and YouTube. If Zoom doesn't work, go to YouTube. If YouTube doesn't work, go to Zoom. We have enabled closed captioning in YouTube today. We'll see how it looks. If it works well, that's great. Uh, really from our side, we've done everything we can for giving you good audio and video experience. It's up to them to deliver it to you guys. So we apologize if that's something that you're not able to receive in good quality, but really that's something that's not in our hands. So remember that, you know, try to reserve the Q&A for comments, sorry, Q&A and comments for relevant questions to the speakers and the panelists and try to avoid some of the things that I've highlighted earlier to make sure that they're actually relevant. With that said, I hope you're ready for takeoff. Uh, this talk will really help understand how the AI and the machine learning models that Chris and uh, Jacob spoke about actually get implemented in a real fab-like environment. And for that, I'm glad to kick off day three on September 29th today with the topic of building AI models in the fab. Today's talk will be presented by Steve Esbenshade. Steve has worked as a software system. Uh, he's worked on software systems in KLA for over 25 years as an engineer, manager, architect, and a mentor. He's a graduate from Santa Clara University. He's with focus on image processing. He's passionate about good systems engineering and training engineers to be good system thinkers. His recent focus has been developing a software platform for training AI models to help meet KLA's next generation image processing needs. With that under the belt, let's go and hear what Steve has to say about building AI models in the fab. Hello and welcome to my talk on AI models in the fab. My name is Steve Espen Jade and thank you for joining me today. Let's start with some KLA terminology so you understand uh, from the perspective of this talk what KLA does. There are many other things that I won't address in this talk that KLA uh, also does, but specific to this talk we'll discuss. Let's talk about electronics um, to start with. So electronics are built with integrated circuits or computer chips. Um, this is in your computer, your smartphone, your car, pretty much every electronic uh, device in your house uh, they're ubiquitous. Integrated circuits are manufactured in a semiconductor fabrication plant or factory. We call it a fab for short. In the fab, these chips are manufactured on wafers. For cost-effective uh, manufacturing, many chips are uh, produced on a single wafer at one time, and it's just this 300 millimeter diameter 
disc of silicon. It's a very thin disc, but 300 millimeters in diameter. Defects are just abnormalities in these chips when they're being produced. Um, abnormalities that will cause them to fail. Uh, yield is just a measure of how many chips on the wafer can be sold versus ones that had to be thrown away. And uh, the defects can be of various different types. And, you know, good examples are shorts and opens because these are things, you know, that just a general understanding of electronics. You know what those are. But there are many other types of defects that we're not going to go into in this talk. The defect of interest is the most critical defects or the, the, the defects that cost the customers the most. Um, so these are the ones that they're really interested in finding. And these are important for them to keep their costs down, to keep their yields up, and ultimately to be able to sell you inexpensive electronics. So KLA as a company makes it possible for customers, our customers, to sell inexpensive electronics to the consumers of the world. Now, the process of finding these defects is what we call defect detection, or also another term for that is inspection. Um, we image the chips under some type of microscope and then apply some algorithm to find those defects. Um, defect classification is the process of identifying the type of defect, whether it's a short or an open. So you have to find it and then you classify it. Hardware is just a general term we use to differentiate um, from software. Our tools are uh, a combination of, of different hardware and software. So computers, robots, mechanics, optics, these are all, the sensors are all hardware. In this talk, we'll talk about two specific tool types that we sell to our customers um, that both have AI technology uh, built into them. The first one, the Cronus 1190, is an automated wafer inspection tool based on an optical microscope. So based on the optical microscope, this is a very high throughput system that can process 40 to 60 wafers per, per hour, which is pretty fast. And this then can be used in high volume manufacturing where they're producing chips for the end user. Um, the SL10, on the other hand, is a scanning electron beam based system. And so while scanning electron beams are very high resolution, they're very slow. Um, so you have to pick very specific areas that you want to inspect. These are used in R&D and they're also used in finding the, the very smallest of defects and in some difficult classification, um, defect classification tasks. Process variation um, is, is kind of a difficult thing to explain. Um, but the, the process of making these chips is highly complex. The materials used, the, the process steps used vary very significantly. And because of that, we get very different uh, looking images and, and very different types of defects. And so process variation um, creates a, quite a, a big challenge for us in the process of finding and classifying these defects for our customers. Now let's talk a little bit about AI terminology, not specific to KLA, but things you need to kind of be familiar with. Um, machine learning is really just an application of AI where instead of the traditional algorithms that are developed via some mathematic um, formula developed and then you code that and create a program that can process some images maybe with some uh, filters or, or things like that. Um, machine learning is really about providing examples to uh, a, a program that can learn it from the examples. And so rather than the hand coding, um, it's just learning from these labeled examples. Deep learning is just a subfield. Oh, and, and you know, a, a canonical example of that is the cats and dogs pictures, right? So if you have a bunch of pictures of cats and dogs and you label them as cats and dogs, you can train the computer or the model 
how to identify a, a picture with a cat and a picture with a dog. Um, deep learning is really just a subfield of that, and that's really taken off in the last um, couple of decades here with artificial neur neural networks, and these were inspired by the human brain. So it kind of behaves like a human brain. Artificial intelligence is ML and DL models that are used uh, to do these complex tasks that humans are good at. And uh, in our particular case, it's to find and classify defects. And of course, labels are important because in order to train these models, you've got to have good labels. You've got to be able to identify the location of defects and the classification of those defects so that then you can train the models to do um, what a human would be able to do. And this allows us then to have an automated solution that we just talked about. So now that you have the terminology, I'll give you a short intro about the company. you enjoyed that little intro uh, about the company and hopefully with the terminology it, you were able to kind of follow that so now I'd like to talk about you know what it is that is challenging about the semiconductor fab environment in terms of introducing AI technology into our products we'll talk a little bit about tensorflow is that all you need just a deep learning framework and then we'll talk about an AI architecture um, that we've developed for building models for several of our products. So why is AI challenging, a unique challenge for what we're trying to do? Right, so I'd like to go over some, some very specific challenges that we deal with. And then we'll talk about some just common sort of universal AI challenges that we also have to deal with. You may be familiar with this movie, Mission Impossible. Ethan Hunt here is uh, breaking in through an air duct to steal some information from the FBI computer. And this is because it's air gapped. So the fab environment is very much like the FBI. They have this very high security because their chip designs are their intellectual property. And if they lose that, if their competitors get a hold of that, they can lose their business. Um, so they're very uh, security conscious. And because of that, they have an air-gapped environment where they're isolated from the outside world. No internet connections for things to get in and out of the fab. They're very much like uh, Las Vegas, right? The pictures that are taken in the fab stay in the fab. Nothing goes out. And uh, so this makes it a, a very challenging environment because unlike maybe uh, Google or Amazon where they can get images off of the internet and they can build their models and then export their models, um, there's data scientists don't have this challenge. 
here we have this challenge where we can't send uh, our engineers, all of our engineers out there into the fab to build models for the customer. We have to put a product out there that can be utilized to build them out there in the wild, if you will, uh, in this air-gapped environment. Human error rates are always a problem for AI um, because the quality of the model that you build uh, is only as good as the data that you use to build that model. And so when humans mislabel things, um, this creates challenges for uh, trouble for, for building these models. Um, and this is, is always an issue. But in our particular case, um, it's much more challenging to classify, to, to identify and classify these defects in these chip images than it is to do sort of the, you know, identify cats and dogs. And so this leads to um, a very a difficult process of building good models that are going to perform well for the customer. So here's an example of a SEM image um, from our scanning electron beam system, the ESL10. You may be able to identify the defects in this image. Um, this is not a customer image. This is a, uh, a, a, a general usable image. Um, it's not a specific customer design. Um, and you may see, you know, there's a there's an uh, bridge here. It looks like a like a short maybe. There's something here that is close to bridging, maybe that creates some leakage between there. Maybe a, uh, something that doesn't fail immediately, but maybe fails in a short period of time, being out into a product. And so these are the types of things that our customers would want to find and identify. Uh, and these are not the most challenging. The, the customer images are even more challenging than this, which we can't show you in this presentation, obviously, as we talked about before. They're, they're locked up in their fab. Um, so now, this shows you um, another view of that, where we have this blinking image. And, and what this is showing you is two different chips um, the same location, the same pattern on two different chips, and we're just toggling between the two, between a defective one and a non-defective one. And as you can see, it's, it's easy to see the defects, but it's also, you can see a lot of other things that are changing as well. Um, the edges are, uh, the rough edges are moving around, and, and uh, even the, the intensity of, of the background image there is changing significantly. Um, and so, as you can see in the middle, under traditional, this is kind of how a traditional algorithms would look at these two images and be able to identify the difference between a good and a bad one. It's having a really challenging problem here of identifying where the defects are relative to um, this, this noise because of the differences um, that are not defective. On the far right side, you can see how well the AI algorithms are able to differentiate between things that are not a problem and things that are a problem. And so this is where um, the AI solutions gives us uh, a great advantage in being able to identify the correct things um, that the customer wants to see. And then process variations that we talked about earlier on, this creates a real challenge because our images look very different even though they're not defective as a result of wafer warp, edge changes, and all sorts of, of types of, of processing changes. So these are just some images of what the wafer looks like, right? And if I go back to the previous slide, this color change or this intensity that you change that you see between the good and the defective uh, dye 
um, which is not a defect, right? In the middle there, that's not a defect. Um, that is a result of the process change. And so, again, this is, this is the challenge that we deal with. And one more is this time and cost pressures that our customers have. So the challenge here is that every minute, every minute, every hour that it takes to identify a defect is that much time that bad product is being produced. So this is an assembly line, essentially, right? And, and these wafers are just going through this assembly line and they're producing these chips. And so we need to be able to find and identify the type of defect so that the customer can quickly get back to the root cause of why that defect's being produced so they can fix it. Um, and every, and you know, they're losing millions of dollars uh, if we're not finding that defect quickly. Now, in addition to that, because of the air-gapped environment that we talked about, um, it's very difficult to use any external resources. So everything has to be uh, embedded in the fab with the tool. So everything, everything that processes these images, that, that does all of this, this work of building these models, has to go with the tool. To give you an example, or kind of a way to think about this in terms of the, the volume of data that we have to deal with, one of our tools that generates 40 gigabytes of data per second, imagine a smartphone that you have with 256 gigabytes maybe. Our tool would fill that with images in just about six seconds. And that's running maybe 24-7 with very, very little time in between and very little downtime where it's not processing some wafer image data, collecting and processing wafer image data. So the compute needs are enormous. And that puts a lot of pressure on getting the compute costs down and one of the challenges that we have to deal with. So here are, here's the summary of those challenges and how we address these things. Uh, we address the air gap fab environment and the process and tool variations by exporting a system that can train models at the customer fab in the customer fab based on the images that are there that, we, that you can't get out. Um, to reduce the human error rates that are considerably high, we provide UI tools to visualize and resolve issues, to be able to do efficient labeling and correct problems that might be introduced by incorrect labeling, identify those and, and correct them. And finally, for these time and cost pressures, um, we share the model training infrastructure. Um, we use GPUs, which gives us more cost effective for both training and inference. And then um, these models are, are shared across tools and are used to do the detection and classification process in an automated way uh, so that it, it's done at the rate that the data is coming out of the tool without, with very little user interaction necessary, user involvement necessary. So some challenges that are not unique to KLA, but are also challenges that we have to deal with, uh, is training. And training is only as good as the data. So insufficient data or, uh, or, um, not enough unique data or not good data uh, will result in bad models. So this is uh, our training system that we'll talk about later on, but imagine you have a training set and these images are not very unique, they're all fairly similar. If I then use train a model and use that on another test image that wasn't seen during training, 
I'm not going to get a very good result. It's going to identify a bunch of things that it thinks might be defects, and this really doesn't help me. However, if I have a good training set with a variety of images, of defects, um, then I can train a good model. And again, like I said, this is not unique to us. This is a general problem that AI has. Another common problem for AI is in terms of building the capabilities to, to um, train and, and use these models. And so we need um, engineers across a wide um, variety of disciplines, both on the data engineering side and the data scientist side. And there's some overlap in between them. And so you, you've heard um, talks more maybe about the, the data scientist side where they're you know, creating models, um, doing feature engineering, more statistical based stuff and data visualization to understand the data. Um, but on the other side, we also need data engineers. We need software engineers, people who can build software systems and databases and manage the data. And uh, there's some common overlap. These engineers and scientists have to work together to build the system that, that can do um, what our customers need. So we need a variety uh, of, of different disciplines and uh, maybe you can help in, in one of these areas if you're interested. So the Kronos 1190 system that we talked about earlier, this high volume um, processing system um, used for more low resolution uh, defect types is an optical inspection tool that uses uh, AI for defect classification. And we call this uh, defect wise. And it's based on the same uh, deep learning uh, AI infrastructure that we've built um, as the other system that we were talking about today. Uh, the ESL 10 and it's called smarts so they have different names but under the hood the fundamental uh, capabilities or the architecture that this is built on is very common on the ESL 10 we use it for both detection and classification as previously discussed and so now we'll talk a little bit about the services that make up this infrastructure. So it's a service-based um, architecture, if you're familiar with uh, software architecture, and uh, we'll talk about the main components of that here. So there's the user interface, uh, which is a web browser-based interface that provides the ability to look at images and label them, identify the defects and classify them, visualize results of models and, and troubleshoot problems in model training. We've got the database, which is used to store those images and labels. Once you've spent time, uh, you know, valuable user time uh, labeling some data, you want to store that to train models and be able to reuse that for many model trainings. And uh, this also supports the capability of, of saving some recipe parameters uh, in order to um, get a good model um, from this data. Saving the models, the results, everything that it would be useful to look at and reuse in the future um, gets archived here. And we got the SMARTS training algorithm where the TensorFlow uh, framework is leveraged um, to build the models, these deep learning uh, AI models. We also have some traditional physics-based algorithms. Uh, these would be algorithms based on the properties of our, op of our optical imaging or, or SEM imaging systems. Um, so there's a combination of sort of these traditional image processing and model image processing that happens here. Um, and as you can see, you know, we talked about earlier, uh, there's more than just TensorFlow needed here. TensorFlow is, is a key part of, of what we do. 
and it's uh, important for, for the data scientists, um, but there's a lot of other things here for the data engineers to deal with. We've got the Smart Training Service, which just provides a web server front end to the training algorithm and interfaces it to the rest of the system, allows us to um, utilize the GPUs effectively. And finally, we've got this service that provides the data exchange between the legacy systems and uh, this system. So, you know, we've been building these physics-based uh, inspection tools for many decades going back into the 70s, 1970s. And more recently now we're introducing the AI uh, capabilities and so this is kind of um, interfacing the the old uh, the older if you will technology with the with the newer technology. Here's an example of some of the technology stack that we use um, in these services. And now I'll talk uh, briefly about how the architecture behaves uh, with, a, with a little cartoon example of how an image flows through the system. And this is just an example of one image, one SEM image, how it would go through the system and how we would build the models. Obviously there would you would need many images like we said before in order to get a good model you need uh, a variety of image data. So we collect this image um, perhaps we have uh, some legacy algorithm here that helps us to identify where the defects might be. It may not be uh, quite as good but it might be a good hint. The user looks at that, zooms in on it, um, finds the defects, labels them, um, provides a, a localization boundary, as well as maybe a classification of what type it is. Uh, once the user's happy with that, they, that gets saved into the database. And after labeling enough data, you can start the training process, and click a button and those images are then sent over to the training algorithm where a model gets trained based on these images and data um, as represented by this simple um, neural network. There are a variety of algorithms that we, uh, networks here that we can train depending on the type of um, application that we need to do. Once that training is done, uh, some result is sent back to the user to visualize and understand how well the model was trained and if there are any issues that need to be adjusted. Um, those things are, are fixed and, and maybe retrained or if it's good, the user says that's good, save it, and everything gets saved in the database. Now I've got a model that I can send back over to the tool and now I finally have my automated wafer inspection tool that can do the job of finding and classifying these defects um, in an automated way with uh, minimal, if any, uh, needed user input. Another user can connect to the system and can look at the images and the data and everything because it's all stored and available and they can maybe train another model, um, improve it, whatever, and that can then be used. And this is connected up to multiple tools so that we can share the data, so we can share the models, all within the fab, of course, uh, because of the air gap, and that um, amortizes the, the cost of the system. And that's the end of my talk, thank you for coming to my talk and now we'll take some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Steve, for a very insightful talk on some of our infrastructure. So let me, uh, there's lots of questions that I can came up in the um, Q&A section 
And Steve has actually already gone in and answered a bunch of them. Actually, the panelists have been hard at work answering several questions. I've picked up a bunch, Steve, which I thought would be interesting for the uh, listeners to hear you answer. Some of them are already answered uh, in, in typing mode, but I thought, anyway, let's anyway go over some of them again. So one common question that came up, Steve, is what is TensorFlow? And maybe a quick background on what TensorFlow is and what it enables. Sure. Um, so TensorFlow is a deep learning framework that um, Google developed. Um, it was you know, developed internally by Google for their own uh, AI research. And then it was open sourced and made available for other people to use. Um, several years ago, when we started looking at um, you know, what framework we wanted to use, uh, this just seemed like uh, a good choice. There were, there were several out there. Um, there's there's PyTorch, there's um, MXNet, there's there's these other um, many other frameworks that are out there that you can use. Um, but we happened to choose this one because because Google was behind it. We figured that it would get a lot of um, a lot of support, and um, it it turned out to we think be a good choice. It it's a good sort of a good mix between um, R and you know sort of the R and D. Um, aspects of things that we have to do. And we have to put a production system in the field so, so it has a good um, you know, production use case for um, efficiency for throughput. Um, and so there, there are other choices we could have picked, but that's the one that, that we're using. Okay, fantastic, thanks. Right, let's go on to question two. I'm gonna read this question verbatim, right? And we'll try to interpret this a little bit. So. Uh, person asks, I would like to verify my understanding. The machine learning model training is done on servers, maybe in AWS or Google Cloud, but the real-time evaluations are done on the edge. Is that correct? Or if not, what is the right way that the training and inference happens? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the so, so we do not use um, any uh, cloud-based services like AWS or Google um, for building our models because our models are built in the fab environment, like we talked about this air-gapped environment. So we actually sell a, uh, a cloud, if you will, uh, a mini cloud that goes with the tool into the fab. And so we have this, um, this uh, training server system that is kind of like a mini cloud that is used for building building the models. Um, it's kind of like an offline system, if you will, so that the tool doesn't uh, get hampered, doesn't get prevented, you know, doesn't prevent the tool from doing its job of inspecting wafers and finding defects. So these models are trained on a server and then they're exported back to the tool. And, and so that would be, you know, the edge, if you will, um, concept. Uh, but it, it's all essentially in the edge in, in the sense that it's all in the customer's uh, manufacturing facility. There is no external connection to a cloud service that, can, that we can use. Okay, great. Thanks. And so actually the next question leads off your answer, right? So the question is, how do you verify the model if you build the model in the field? Yeah, so um, we have to we have to build into our system these capabilities to uh, visualize. We talk about data visualization to visualize the results of the model in a way that a um, not as highly trained person can look at it and determine whether it, it's working properly or not and what needs to be done. So um, it, through, through visualization of the images, the defects that it finds, whether it found the defects at the right locations, whether it's finding a bunch of nuisance, we, you know, it, it's picking up like, like the example I showed of the slide that has the poor training examples, you get uh, a bunch of false alarms, if you will. It says, oh, I think there's a defect over here and there's no defect there. So through that and through some uh, other visualization techniques, the user is able to figure out if, the model is, is finding defects and ignoring the, the spurious stuff that we don't want to find. And it, it requires some you know, knowledge of the semiconductor 
uh, process, which our customers are, are the experts in that, right? So they understand what is a defect and what's not. And we simply then give them the tools to, to help show how well the model is, is finding their, their defects of interest. Okay, great, thanks. Ken, the next question leads off from this, right? So uh, how do the UI tools work and how does it enable data visualization? Well, it's a combination of a couple of questions we received. Yeah, again, it's, um, it, it really boils down to uh, visualization of these images, these defects, getting uh, good pictures of the defects under the right um, conditions, and then uh, you know, highlighting or, or helping the user to see those. Um, there, there's a lot that we do with the customer design um, that, that also helps us in terms of we can, we can overlay their design with the image and they can see um, where the defect is relative to the design and that helps them understand it. Um, and, and then we provide Again, the visualization of um, what the, the Pareto, we call a Pareto of defects are that they found and, and this confusion matrix, which is a, uh, um, a machine learning concept that's been around for a long time in terms of how you look at uh, a, a large set of classified defects and how well it's working in terms of uh, purity and and um, classification, all that. And you know, something that I can't really go into detail uh, about because you really got to understand that uh, defect classification process, which we didn't explain in this talk. Okay, great. But I think you gave a good sense for you know, how the visualization actually works. Thanks for that. Uh, next question, Steve. Are SEM-based defect inspection tools like the ESL-10 used on customer sites in inline manufacturing or are they mostly used by customers for R&D activities? Yeah, so SEM-based tools are used in both applications. Um, they're they're uh, more predominantly used in research and development, which is when they're designing a new chip um, or figuring out a new process, um, making the chips, making the you know geometry smaller so they can put more transistors in one chip, and that's that gives you the next generation better functionality. So as they're developing that process, <clears throat> they need the SEM is very critical to understanding the new types of failures that they're having, the new types of defects, and then um, troubleshooting that back to what the root cause of that is. Excuse me. Um, changing the, you know, fixing the problems with their process and 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 ramping up the yield um, to to when they can start producing these chips in high volume. Um, once they've transitioned from research and development to now high volume, um, they still have problems with excursions. Uh, excursions are when um, you know things are going away along nicely, and then all of a sudden something bad happens, and and the chips are all coming out bad, right? Lots of defects, and when they need to go in and troubleshoot and figure out what this change is, um, again they're going to use a SEM tool to do that. Uh, SEM tools are also used um, very heavily for setup of other optical inspection tools that don't have the resolution. And so there's still a lot of use of that um, in the high volume manufacturing as well. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, I think the last question to you, what's the difference between CPU, GPU, and TPU? Okay, so um, CPU is sort of the common thing, you know, you would learn about, you know, traditionally in, uh, computer science, right? So CPU, central processing unit, is your standard chip um, that your computers, your smartphones, um, things run on, right? Your general purpose programming runs on those. So if you write programs in, in Java, in C, C++, in Python, these things generally run on a CPU. Um, a GPU, a graphics processing unit, um, is very different. Now, GPUs were initially designed 
for uh, gaming systems, right? NVIDIA, you know, came out with the, this GPU that, that would allow them to do um, these interactive gaming systems where, you know, first person um, type systems, right? And, and it was designed to, uh, to give you a very, um, a very good experience with, with very high quality moving video, right? Um, what the, it turns out that the, the matrix operations that these chips are really good at um, are also very good for deep learning, for neural networks. And so the GPU chips have been adapted for that. And, and so it, it's, a, it's a much faster processor for deep learning type applications. Uh, it's also can be used for many other applications. So we're finding many um, traditional algorithms that would be written to run on a CPU can be optimized using CUDA code to run on a GPU. And you can run it then much faster. It's, it's more cost effective, right? So if I can, if I can um, you know, for half the cost, I can do the same job on a GPU, it makes sense. Um, the TPU is a very specific um, processor. It's, a, it's another, we, we call these in general hardware accelerators. It's another very specific chip that, um, that Google came up with to do um, tensor processing. And, and so they use it for uh, very, very fast um, computation of their AI workloads. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm just, I was just scrubbing through some of the other questions, several questions that were asked today, you know, about, about the company, et cetera, please go to our website and find out a lot of information that's already available on the website. And some of the questions with respect to terminology, particularly Steve's actually done a wonderful job in his video, the first uh, little bit of the playback, actually he goes over a lot of terminology. So I would encourage all of you to go back and see the terminology slide and chances are that most of the questions that are asked on terminology were already answered by Steve in that slide, in those slides. So with that, I'd like to thank Steve very much for taking time to prep the talk, to be here, answer questions, Steve. Thank you very much for taking the time. And thanks to everyone who dialed in today. Uh, we're, gonna dial, we're gonna end it a little early today, give you back seven minutes of your evening. And uh, we switch gears from tomorrow, go closer to metal, go closer to hardware, where Mark will come and talk about an important problem on the GPU and how to make sure that you program for minimizing the overheads. Thank you very much for dialing in. See you all tomorrow, 8.30 IST, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Have a good evening. Have a good day.